if in the 20th century we had urbanization and industrialization as the major forces propelling changes in global health, globalization constituted the tailwind of the 20th century and is becoming one of the principal propellants of changes in global health in the 21st century. Now, globalization is a process of greater integration within the world economy through movements of goods and services, capital, technology, and to a lesser extent, labor, which lead increasingly to economic decisions being influenced by global conditions. Countries are no longer locked in within their territories but are greatly influenced by what is happening elsewhere in the world and by forces flowing into their own territories. Globalization can affect health either in a positive way or a negative way, and indeed we are seeing both these kinds of effects. In terms of positive effects, clearly knowledge can be shared much faster across the world. The world is now committed to common health goals like the Sustainable Development Goals, there is increased access to drugs, vaccines, and technologies produced anywhere in the world, and they can flow to other countries as well. And it's not always one-sided. There can be reverse innovation in which low- and middle-income countries, which are actually acting as crucibles of innovation, are now producing very important innovations which can now be adopted even in the high-income countries to good effect. And global partnerships are emerging both to provide greater financial support to the health system as well as non-financial support, for example, technical support and capacity building of health professionals and so on. There are also several negative effects of globalization. Rapid spread of viruses, bacteria, and other infectious agents can actually convert limited outbreaks into epidemics and epidemics into pandemics which affect many countries. We have seen that in Ebola. We have seen that in a number of other viral infections. We have also seen how antibiotic resistance spreads from one country to another. There is also a transnational trade in tobacco and unhealthy foods as well as beverages, which spreads them in an equally fast manner across countries and can erode health in very many ways. Now, we find that increased economic inequalities are a major manifestation now of globalization, and they can be very unsettling for health of countries which are very vulnerable to those kind of inequalities, especially where the poor suffer the consequences the most. The brain drain of health professionals, whether it's doctors, nurses, or paramedics, flowing from countries which need them most because of their own health workforce crisis to other countries which have higher incomes and have a pull factor is actually going to be a major threat to global health in the 21st century. We have already seen that happen in the 20th century, but this is going to get exacerbated by globalization because even services are now covered under the world trade agreements. There are also skewed priorities for donor funding. Some of these negative and positive examples of globalization are very vividly seen in terms of economic liberalization. In Russia, for example, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, during a transition to market economy in the early 1990s, there was a drastic fall in life expectancy, particularly in male life expectancy. And about 1.4 to 1.6 million premature deaths occurred during 1990 to 1995. And a great proportion of these was among the working age men. And the factors cited for this effect are that there was a further deterioration of the already poor Russian diet. There was markedly increased alcohol consumption, a great deal of mental stress in a turbulent period of transition, a surge in accidents and injuries, and very importantly, a reduced public spending on health care. A feature of the socialist economy was a considerable emphasis on universal health coverage. Now, that was unsettled in the new environment. On the other hand, in Poland, we have seen a contrasting picture being reported 
in which cardiovascular mortality rates, which were generally very high in Central and Eastern Europe, suddenly started declining very sharply in Poland in contrast to their neighbors. And this was attributed by Polish epidemiologists to an increased access to fruit and vegetables flowing in through a free market, and also the availability of healthy edible oils, which made it possible for people to move from previously subsidized animal fats to healthy edible oils, which are now available at affordable prices. Thomas Friedman, in a highly acclaimed book on the advantages of globalization, says that the world has now become flat, putting all countries, high, low, and middle income, on the same footing. However, we know that even a flat surface can become tilted. And we know also from our experience that indeed, because of the asymmetry of economic and military power, globalization has worked to the advantage of the high-income countries who could set the terms. And it has worked to the disadvantage in many ways of low- and middle-income countries who had to be the unwilling recipients of many trade agreements and other economic deals. Trade-related intellectual property agreements are a very important manifestation of how globalization has played out in a very real way to the disadvantage of low- and middle-income countries. When the TRIPS agreement was originally formulated, the high-income countries were in the driving seat. And the agreements work to the advantage of intellectual property rights as well as manufacturers in the high-income countries. However, particularly feeling the pain of low access to essential medicines, the low- and middle-income countries fought for relaxation of those provisions and won through the Doha Declaration a right to adopt compulsory licensing and other provisions in order to protect public health, to meet urgent public health needs. Even those concessions that were won are now being sought to be diluted or subverted by introduction of TRIPS plus provisions in free trade agreements which are now being crafted either bilaterally or multilaterally. And some of these provisions include data exclusivity, which prevents generic manufacturers in low- and middle-income countries from accessing trial data of previously patented drugs, which is required for licensing their manufacture. And in terms of patent term extension, increasing the scope of patents, all of this is happening, especially by reformulating products slightly or combining drugs with a previously patented drug, but trying to seek a new patent for that, all of these are tricks of the trade that are being attempted in order to prevent generic manufacturers in low- and middle-income countries from producing essential drugs. By linking patents to regulatory regimes and, again, causing delays in the manufacturing license, again, this is becoming a problem through free trade agreements. But one of the most dangerous provisions is the investor state dispute settlement provision. Previously, under WTO, it was governments which litigated against governments. Now, by allowing an investor in any country to litigate against a foreign government, uh, invoking the ISDS, many industries are now trying to subvert the provisions of Doha by suing foreign governments, and we'll give you some examples of those. But another area is a, the limitation on compulsory licenses. Doha said that if, for public health reasons, intellectual property rights of a patented drug, which is still actively patented, have to be now shared with generic drug manufacturers or other licensed manufacturers in low- and middle-income countries, it should be permitted. Now, some of these FTAs are trying to put limits on compulsory licenses. There are also border measures which permit seizure by a third country of the passage of generic drugs from the manufacturing country to a, a developing country which is in need if these drugs are passing through that third country. So all of these can be very, very inimical to the 
interests of public health. And we also see that free trade agreement already has started manifesting its ill effects. In terms of drugs in Jordan, the drug prices increased by 25% since the free trade agreement. And 25% of the health budget is now spent on drugs as a result of the raised prices. And the introduction of generics has been delayed. Similarly, Philip Morris registered itself in Hong Kong to bring a claim against Australia because Australia introduced plain packaging of all tobacco products. And Philip Morris litigated against it using the provisions of a bilateral investment treaty and some other treaties as well. Fortunately, both in terms of Uruguay and in terms of Australia, the suits failed, but there was prolonged vexatious litigation and a delay in the introduction of very important tobacco control measures. However, Samoa was not equally lucky in food because the import of turkey tails from United States of America, highly fat-rich and which also aggravated to some extent the obesity epidemic in Samoa, was attempted to be prevented by the government of Samoa, but under the WTO provisions, Samoa was forced to import turkey tails from the United States. And even in terms of providing food to the poor, when India enacted a Food Security Act at the WTO meeting in Bali, the subsidized food procurement, the public procurement policy, which would have actually put less expensive food into the public distribution system, was contested very vigorously, uh, and India was attempted to be stalled. But fortunately, again, after vigorous fight, India won its case. So free trade agreements can actually be major impediments to public health. So what needs to be done is that we need to make more resources available for health systems without imposing donor agendas of any kind. And expanding and improving developmental assistance and improving debt relief can provide this pathway. We must also reform the international trade regime, and we must recognize health as a human right. Because whenever public health and economic interests collide, unless we actually uphold health as a human right, the economic interests, particularly commercial interests, will tend to trump public health needs. We must actually reverse that situation. And we must ensure that national social protection programs, as a part of social justice, are not impeded by global financing. So in the 20th century, the momentum for globalization was built up through a sense of shared vulnerability, the fear of pandemics, the fear of bioterrorism, and so on. So people said we must actually cooperate so that we avoid some of these threats. In the 21st century, we must actually gain ground for globalization in the right manner through shared values, a commitment to health as a human right, universal health coverage, and global solidarity.